Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk at this lecture series. I've, I've watched a lot of them, but this is my first time actually um, presenting, so it's really exciting for me. Uh, okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, go over primarily the mission of SNMREC, um, trying to develop ocean energy, renewable energy, from the Gulf Stream, which flows just off offshore Florida here. And there's one thing, there was a, a slight typo, but it might be applicable, it depends on what you think about my talk, is the brochure you have, it has a question mark after <laughs> power from the Gulf Stream for South Florida. There's a question mark there. Well, in my title, there's not, but maybe that was some Freudian thing that Dennis put in to see, see whether he thinks, <laughs> the, the, or maybe, it, I, yeah, maybe it was in my email or something. So anyway, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll dispel with that question mark based on my presentation. So, um, like he said in the in the beginning, I'm um, I, uh, I'm from Florida, and I've stayed in Florida my entire life, both in school and with the Navy. I was stationed down in Fort Lauderdale, and so I have a lot of experience working out in the Gulf Stream, primarily the the Florida Current, which is the portion that that flows off of South Florida down there. And there's a lot of a lot of things about the Gulf Stream that you'll see in my presentation that that people don't really understand until they either experience it or you take the time to study it and try to characterize the environment, which is what we need to do if we're actually going to extract power um, from the current. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, just the this, this structure and why SNMREC even exists. So back in 2008, uh, the Department of Energy um, decided to incorporate marine renewable energy, or MRE, into their portfolio of, of, of energy. And so they put out a, um, a request for proposals, and three different centers won that, won that particular um, request. Hawaii, um, Hawaii uh, won one for waves and OTEC, which is ocean thermal energy conversion. That's basically where you pull cold water up from the deep, do some thermal conversions to it, generate electricity, and you discharge the now warmer water. So you've extracted power from the, the water that way. Um, at Oregon State and University of Washington, they are primarily waves and tides because since they're higher up um, from, in the latitude perspective, they have larger tides than we do down here in Florida. And so there's a, a larger tidal range for them to, to use to generate power. And then the Southeast National Marine Renewable Center, based at FAU, on ocean currents. And again, that's because we have uh, a relatively unique resource just offshore of us here, the, the Gulf Stream. So here's just a, a quick little diagram of where we are. And again, I just kind of mentioned that. So Oregon, um, it's actually in Oregon at Oregon State University and the University of Washington. Hawaii is obviously not to scale. But uh, <laughs> Hawaii is doing the wave and the ocean thermal again because they're, because they're on a volcano. They're really close to very deep water, so you can get really cold water and bring it up. It's much more accessible for them than a lot of other places. Um, and then, of course, SNMREC's down here, Ocean Current. And OTEC is on here because we're not necessarily doing the same procedure that, that Hawaii is, where we're bringing the cold water up and using it to create energy. We're, um, we have a, a concept where we use cold water air conditioning. So we'd bring this cold water up off the seafloor, run it through a heat exchanger into like a large building or a hotel or something, and use that to exchange the heat from the air conditioning system instead of using Freon and compressors and all that sort of stuff. So that's more cold water, in, cold water um, air conditioning, but it is a kind of an ocean thermal energy, if you will, or offsetting conventional energy to do air conditioning. OK, so that's kind of kind of um, who we are and why we're here. And of course, you know, DOE's up in Washington, but we don't talk about that very much. Um, so what I like to, to show, because I do a lot of these presentations, um, primarily with, with uh, schools and public like library presentations and stuff, is to show you this is a NASA animation of ocean currents, okay? So right here you see Florida, and this is the Florida current come up through here. Gulf of Mexico, you've probably heard of the loop current. This is loop current here, and it sheds off eddies. And then this is the Gulf Stream that's heading off to the North Atlantic. But if you'll notice, as it pans around the Earth, just this is all ocean currents. It's not waves. I mean, it's not... Um, weather patterns like you usually see. These are all ocean currents. It just shows how dynamic the Earth is um, and just how much potential energy, if you think about all these different currents that are accessible. Now here's South Africa. This is the Agulhas current here. 
That's another one of the currents that are similar to the Gulf Stream that, that we've been working with them trying to develop this technology. Um, and then if you come up, here's the, uh, the Middle East here around India. There's, there's some various currents up in here. We're not really dealing with them that much because they have <laughs> enough energy materials for the moment. And then the other um, boundary current, which I'll talk about in just a moment, is um, over here off of Japan. This is called the Kuroshio current. And uh, it, again, it's a, it's a type of current similar to the Gulf Stream. And we've been dealing a lot with Japan, trying to also work with them and develop um, renewable energy technologies from that current to kind of offset their recent nuclear issues and some other things that they have going on. Now, if you notice, the Pacific really doesn't have have that much along our, our western coast, that's for different reasons, which I probably won't get into right now, but again, I just, the overall view that just how much motion is in the ocean, right, I mean, I know that's kind of a cliche, but there's so much potential energy out there, and if we can even harness a very small amount of it, then, you know, there's real potential for us to, um, to, to uh, eliminate our reliance on, on fossil fuels. And then, of course, there's, there's Antarctica and the circumpolar current, which just, there's nothing to block it, so it just runs faster and faster. Unfortunately, it's extremely inaccessible, and it would take a really long extension cord to get that power back to us anyway. So that's just more of a, a model of just how, how high these currents can go. And then obviously there's Australia, and there's the East Australian current that runs along, and that's another potential source, but it's not quite as high in potential as some of these other currents that, uh, that I'll talk about. So, so, speaking of that, so um, SNMREC, along with some other agencies, did some global assessments to determine just which areas may hold um, practical uses of ocean energy, or marine uh, kinetic energy from currents. And so we had Florida, Japan, and South Africa, which I've already mentioned. But if you'll notice, there's an awful lot of the Earth that, that doesn't have these resources, right? So we tend to look at marine current um, energy more as a tool in, a t in an overall toolbox. So it's not the solution, but it could be a very significant solution for a specialized place. And it turns out that between Japan, South Florida, and even up, there is some work off of North Carolina as well, and then in South Africa, these are also very high population areas. So they have really large um, demands for power relative to some other places. So it's it really fits a good niche as far as this is a renewable source of, of um, power at a place where it's needed. Okay, so that's why we're focusing on this particular aspect. The other three, two centers that we have are working on other, other resources, as I mentioned. And like I was watching a, a documentary the other day, and it was about oil, and these oil men were sitting back smoking their big cigars and stuff, and they were saying, well, the wind doesn't always blow, and the sun doesn't always shine, but these currents always flow. Okay, so... Day or night, sun or shine, it's still, uh, they still flow. So anyway, it seems to be, even though it's not a global source, it is certainly a localized source that can be um, used, hopefully. So now, here comes the government. So BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which used to be Minerals Management Service from the Gulf of Mexico fame, they have, as well as in the Gulf, they also have these lease blocks on the continental shelf or the uh, outer continental shelf of the United States. And so each one of these blocks is a three mile by three mile square. And so if you want to try to generate electricity or do any sort of energy based research, you need to get a lease from Boehm to do that. And so we, we have acquired a lease down here off of Fort Lauderdale um, near our SeaTech facility from Boehm to, get, to actually do this work and to try to promote ocean energy development. So SNMREC engineering. So Dennis said that this is what I do, which I do most of it, but this is also what the whole engineering group, which at the moment it's kind of me. But, but this is what SNMREC does in support of the marine renewable industry. Because even though we're, you're going to see some of the equipment we're building, we are not an ocean energy technology development center. We're here to enable developers to be able to, do, to build their equipment and test it. Okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So, but uh, yeah, again, our main tasks are design, build, and test these MRE systems, marine renewable energy, manage the data collection equipment because since it's out in the environment, we have to monitor in the environment, and there's a significant amount of equipment that we have to use, and it's specialized. So we have to work on that sort of thing. 
um, and then conduct surveys, not only for the design, but regulatory compliance, and then research support. Because even though the primary goal of our, our site is for ocean energy, it also provides a persistent location and structure out in the ocean environment that's fairly difficult to get to. And so what we're doing is we're reaching out to scientists, like, like Dennis mentioned, if they want to put specific sensors or use our equipment out there also for doing like ocean observing and that sort of stuff, then it's a way to leverage off what we're already paying for and installing. So hopefully we'll get some synergy going with that with um, more researchers. And then support customers and facility users. So like I said, again, our primary mission is to establish an offshore test site to where developers can come in and test their equipment in known conditions, have established um, measurement systems based on international standards, and not have to go through the expense themselves with their private funds to establish this test site in a fairly arduous location, which hopefully will become clear here in just a second. Okay. Um, so this is kind of what we're talking about. This is out um, close to the area where we're going to put our site. So this is a buoy that I put in back in 03 when I was still with the Navy. And we had, you know, U.S. Navy on and all this sort of stuff. And so we kept getting calls on radio and also on phone saying, do you have a submarine towing a buoy around out here? I'm like, no, it's attached to the seafloor. And so I wish I, when I took this picture, I, I should have took video and, and, and at least an audio recording because that's about a, it, it doesn't look that big, but that's about a four foot drop in front of that buoy where the flow separates and it's just roaring. It's like a little mini Niagara Falls, if you will. It's just roaring. And I flew to Washington a couple of days after this, and when I came back landing there at Fort Lauderdale, this trail here went back several miles from that buoy, just from the, the water flowing and streaming behind it. And so it's just a tremendous amount of power that's out there um, in the Gulf Stream that, that hopefully will be accessible. So because of that, back in 2008, there were these concept drawings generated um, showing what you know, they, they thought that, that an ocean current system would be. And this, this was leveraged hev heavily on for us to win our proposal with DOE and everything. And so this is a theoretical city up here. We have the turbines down here just off the shelf in the Gulf Stream. This pipe here is for the cold water air conditioning I was telling you about. Another thing that people are thinking about doing with the electricity that's generated is using it to crack water, right? So you're going to separate water into hydrogen and oxygen and then take those gases off separately and use them in fuel cells and that sort of stuff. So that's kind of what this ship is doing here. It's offloading hydrogen and, and, uh, and that sort of stuff. And then as you can see, if you were a fish, this would be kind of an interesting place to, to hang out because of all these different rotors turning and everything. So this is showing, in the full scale, it's showing a few hundred rotors, okay? So when I first started with ocean energy, or when I first saw this picture, now I can show the slide. It kind of reminded me of these type of pictures, right, that they used to have back in the 30s and 40s about space flight and living in space and all that. So there are these concepts, right? And there's a lot of similarities with what is shown here about what eventually happened. But there's also a lot of stuff here that may have been a good idea at the time, but research and development and everything kind of show that, well, maybe we, maybe we don't need turrets for aliens to defend ourselves and stuff like that, right? I mean, so it's just, I, I just thought it was kind of, you know, so it's kind of, I don't know. It just, just struck me as that. But that also looked at me as a challenge saying, okay, well, if this, if this is what people want to do, it's our role as engineers to bring reality into the dream and try to bring that into fruition and make things happen despite the sometimes overrated expectations. So, so anyway, so here we are. Um, so this is, again, this is the Gulf Stream, uh, the Florida current running through here. Actually, the Gulf Stream kind of squeezes up through here and runs around the Antilles. So this whole flow here is, is technically the Gulf Stream, but we always consider this, this high velocity flow right between Florida and the Bahamas as a Gulf Stream. It's actually the Florida current, not that semantics really matter. And here again is a kind of a picture of it here. This is a cross section of the Gulf Stream um, out at about 700 meters, about 2,100 feet of water. And it shows that the highest velocities are pushed to the west. Um, this is called a, a western intensification. It's, a, it's, it's typical of a boundary current that's running around the, a, an ocean basin. I have another slide that will show it a little bit better. But anyway, what this shows, though, is that 
The biggest bang for the buck is over here relatively close to shore where the higher velocities are, right? Which is good from our perspective because we don't have to go, you know, 20, 30, 50 miles offshore in really deep water to get the highest velocities to make the, the highest um, amount of electricity. But what it also shows is that if you can develop a device that doesn't need these really high velocities to operate efficiently, that you have all this real estate out here that you could monopolize on and not have to really fight for that high velocity core. Okay, so one of the things that we also try to do with developers is help them to improve the efficiency of their devices. Because there's a certain thing called a cut-in speed. You may have seen it on like a windmill or something. The wind has to be a certain speed before it will even start turning, right? That's called the cut-in speed. So the lower that speed is, the lower velocities that you can actually make electricity and stuff. So that's part of the, the assistance we try to give developers in working with them and modeling and trying to improve their efficiency. So not everyone is crowded up here in this small little area, but they actually can, can, can monopolize on more of the flow. Um, around. Now these are three different profiles of the Gulf Stream. This one was made in 1890. This one was made in the mid-1980s, in 84. That's with the Stax program. I don't know if anybody may have been involved with that. But, um, and then this was uh, from a cruise ship based in 2005. And if you'll notice, not only that the, the flow is still relatively consistent, well over 100 years, so that gives us you know, a pretty good idea that it is a consistent flow, even though you kind of assume that, but this gives us some actual quantified data saying that the flow is still persistent, the core is still about where it is, and it's still about the same magnitude that it, that it used to be. But it also shows what's interesting is the difference in resolution, right? So they had a few measurements here. They would lower down a little pinwheel, and, and it, would, it would lock in the, the speed at different depths from a sailing vessel anchored out in the Gulf Stream. They did this, it took six months to make this profile down off of Miami. But the resolution that they had to do versus in the 80s when they were making these little point measurements here, each one of these is a current meter, okay? So those, each point is the only place that they actually have a measured value. And then through the magic of interpolation and French curves, they come up and they come up with the profiles based on those, just those point measurements, okay? Whereas this one is what I'm going to talk about in a minute. This was done acoustically, and so this entire region here was sampled about every 20 feet from a cruise ship that went back and forth from Miami to the Bahamas for like a, a couple years. And so they collected all that data, and then they generated that profile. So as time goes by, technology increases, our resolution increases, and our understanding increases. Okay. Um, and so this is one way, well this is the way, that we measure the current. So is everyone familiar with the Doppler effect? So like when a car is coming at you, it sounds like it's going higher and then it, it goes away. Well if you're not, listen to this. <laughs> it took me a while to find this, anyway. The Doppler effect, okay? So what happens is, as the, as the noise source is coming towards you, it seems like it's compressing the sound waves so the pitch goes up, okay? So it's, it starts to rise. As it goes away from you, it, it appears the sound waves are being stretched and the pitch goes down, okay? So now, if you take that same principle and you send an acoustic signal, like a ping, out through the water column and you receive it back, if its frequency that you send it out shifts from what you receive back, if there's a difference in that frequency, if the frequency increases, it means all that water is moving towards you, right? If it goes down, it means the water is moving away from you. And so by using that simple principle, what well, sounds simple, then we're able to determine not only the direction, but the magnitude or the speed of the water going away because the amount of frequency shift is directly proportional to how fast the water is going. So we can get both speed and direction acoustically, okay? So we don't have any little paddle wheels and everything like they use in the stacks experiment that I showed you earlier. So we don't have to have things more at very specific areas. The other thing you can do with acoustics is called time gating. So you only listen every so often, right? So imagine you ping out, you listen the first second, you get a frequency shift and everything. And then you listen two seconds from then, you get a frequency shift. Three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. Well, based on the speed of, t the speed of sound through the water, that's giving you different distances away from the device so you can actually get a profile. So every 10 feet, you can get a really accurate measurement instead of having to have a 
a paddle wheel every 10 feet. Does that make sense? And that dramatically simplifies measurements. And we do that all the time now. Um, they do it for moving vessels. They do it from underwater vehicles. And we go out and we deploy buoys like this. You saw one out in the, um, by the turbine out in the, as you walked in, that buckyball looking thing. Well, that's, that's our poor person's um, alternative to this. This is a, a four foot diameter sphere and it's made of epoxy and glass balls. So it's really strong when it goes underwater. But for the depths that we're talking about, we don't need something this, this large, this heavy, and for $20,000 a piece. So instead, since we're only going down about 1,000 feet, we're able to use those small plastic balls out there, which are perfectly strong enough for 1,000 feet of water, and it costs about $6,000, including labor. And we can build those here at Harbor Branch. So we're optimizing our resources here and also trying to save our budget by using a different orientation. But they all do the same thing. They're all meant to hold the, um, the ADCP at a certain point in the water column. So we put them out in about 1,000 feet of water. They're about 50 feet off of the seafloor. And so, they, you know, to, so then they look up through that remaining 950 feet of water. And every um, 20 feet, we're getting a measurement. So it gives some really accuracy from the bottom all the way to the surface. And you get some really interesting results from that. And then we happen to put out multiples. And then you can start to do some array stuff. So you can see if it's going faster over in this part of the, the Gulf Stream, over here, and how they all interact. And um, now you say, okay, so you're going to take this $100,000 piece of instrument, throw it in 1,000 feet of water, well, how are you going to go get it? Well, fortunately, they've developed this thing called an acoustic release. And so what you do is you send a sound pulse from the surface from a small little unit. It goes down, and if this works. So the sound pulse goes down, talks to the release, let's go, and then the whole thing pops back up to the surface. So now we can recover them from the surface, put it back on the ship, change batteries, hook another couple railroad wheels to it, and throw it back in the water. And what we've been doing lately, to be proactive, is we've been designing our railroad wheels so that they now have loops on them so that the type of RVs that Dennis was talking about, later on we can go back down and recover these anchors so we're not leaving stuff on the bottom and you know, just trying not to make a mess of the place down there. Um, okay, now, that works most of the time. Sometimes, though, it doesn't. So, in 2009, we had a buoy that it didn't come up when we talked to it. And so we went down with the GSL, we still had the submersible, went down, and here's this nice loose cable just laying on the bottom with nothing on it. It's so like, great. So that was in 2009. So in 2013, we get an email, did you lose a buoy? And I'm like, well, <laughs> three, four years ago we did. And so what happened was, Oh, so this is the North Atlantic like I was telling you about. So this is the gyre, the North Atlantic gyre that I was telling you about. So it's basically just a big whirlpool, right? And so the water comes down across the, across the equator, kind of squeezes its way up through the Caribbean, and that's where we get our, our deployment here, okay? So what happened was we, the buoy broke off here in 2009, and it just kind of cruised along for years, got caught up, and then it went into the Azores current, okay? The Azores, which is a little offshoot of the main subtropical gyre here, and it landed up in the Azores, which are just off of Portugal, over, um, over off of Europe, it's just off of Portugal here. And so we got the call, and we're like, oh, well, yeah, that would be nice to get that multi hundreds of thousand dollars equipment back. So I said, yeah, I'll go to the Azores, no problem. So went over there. Um, this is the, the fisherman that found it offshore. So he towed it in for us. This is the guy that, uh, that actually saw it. He was on watch. And this is the poor guy that had to go over and dig out four years of fish guts to get all the equipment and everything. So anyway, so we brought all that equipment back, and now it's refurbished, and we're planning on deploying it in a couple weeks to put it back out in the Gulf Stream. So it was, it was kind of cool. Why did it fail? Well, part of the engineering is knowing materials, right? So what materials do you use in salt water? And if anyone has a boat, you're probably very familiar with rust and that sort of thing. So you don't put what's called dissimilar metals together. So if they have a significant electric potential, like this one's a lot more positive than this one is, in seawater, they tend to eat each other. Well, one eats the other one because of the conductivity. So what happened on here, we had stainless steel, which we typically use because it's relatively inert, on the frame, but by a mistake in, in accounting, in a inventory, we put a regular steel shackle on here. And so that's what happened. So see how this is much more corroded than the stainless steel. So that's called um, 
anodic corrosion. So this gives up electrons and <laughs> gives up itself to protect the stainless steel and it just corroded the wire apart and that's the wire that we found just laying on the seafloor. And this took, it only took about what, eight months, nine months to do that out offshore. So if you don't get that part of it right, then your whole system could pop up and you have to go to Azores, Azores again. But, um, so that's, dissimilar metals is a very important thing. So any of you engineering students learn about dissimilar metals and galvanic corrosion. Um, okay, so after all that, this is the type of data that we, that we get. Um, so this is a profile, the top one is from March of 08 through April of 09. So this is a little over a year worth of data. The surface is up here, the bottom's down here, and the colors represent the speed, the current speed. So red is, is really fast. Two and a half knots is about, I mean, two and a half meters per second is about five knots, or about six miles per hour, which is really fast in the water if you've ever tried to drag behind a boat, I don't know why you would, but if you ever did, you know that even five miles an hour is pretty high. So, and what the data shows us is that up near the surface, especially in the summer, right? In the summer, the velocities get pretty high, but typically down near the bottom, the, the velocities are low. And then it varies quite a bit here in this middle region between 100 and 200 meters. So, but again, see how we're getting resolution through the entire water column as opposed to those sparse measurements throughout the water column from the older technology. And then this is just a zoom in down here from July just a little bit into August, and it really shows how these higher velocities penetrate down 300, 400 feet into the water, especially during the summer, because again, that entire North Atlantic gyre, all these currents are generated by a difference in heat in the ocean. So in the summer, there's more heat going near the equator, you get more of this thermal hailing circulation, which kind of drives the whole system. Whereas in the winter, it kind of it's still flowing, because like I said, it's always flowing, not like the wind of the sun, but it's just of a, a slightly lower magnitude. So again, when you're divide, designing a device, well, you don't want to only be able to generate power in the summer, right? You have to generate power in the winter as well, if it's going to be one of your primary sources. So again, knowing the seasonality of the resource, which is the Gulf Stream, that's, um, that's what we have to do. Now, so that plot is kind of, okay, cool, I saw it, but to see things moving is, is to me, really interesting. So these are three different ABCPs that we had. They're three miles apart. This one is in uh, 260 meters of water, and this one's out to 340. So this is deeper, and north is coming this way. So imagine you're kind of looking down on the current from the northwest and just watching it. And each one of these lines is a vector. So that's the speed and the direction of water in that. Remember that 20-foot layer I told you about? And as you can see, up near the surface, there's a, it's much higher than down here near the seafloor, right? That, which makes sense. So now if you animate that over time, because a lot of people say, well, the Gulf Stream is just a river in the ocean. It's just you know, it's constant. It's always running. But when you're designing something, you need to bound the problem, right? You need to know the maximum so you make sure that it doesn't break when it gets to that point. You need to know the minimum um, so that it will at least come close to functioning when you get down that low. And you just need to know how much it will vary, especially if you're trying to generate power for thousands, millions of people ever make that you might do, right? So what I've done is, it, is I wrote a program that animated this through time. So these are all, each time you see it, it's at the same time for all three of them. And it just gives you an idea of, of not only how closely they follow each other, but how different they are in their own respects, OK? And again, this is the Gulf Stream out in two, almost 2,000, well, about 1,500 feet of water. So. So um, you see that it's pretty consistent up near the surface, but they all kind of surge and then fall back and then wiggle and wave and vary around. So by no means is it a constant fire hose, just water coming out at constant speed. Not only is it changing in magnitude, which is the length of all those arrows, but the directions are changing. It's wobbling back and forth. And, um, and it, just gives, it just gives you, well, it gives me a better feeling of just how variable this water is, and then how that's that's yet another challenge to us to make sure that whatever we put out there can actually work effectively and efficiently, and and make sure things are are as we plan. So um, so that's uh, that's another way that we get multiple data sets so that we can see at different depths because the deeper you get, obviously you're getting closer to that channel. Remember I showed you that one plot, so they go fast faster out there. 
but we want to see if it's comparable closer to shore so that we don't have to lay cables because the cables are like four million dollars a mile to lay cables all right and we're talking about 12 to 15 miles offshore is the resource so if we can save a few miles we can save a significant amount of money especially since it's four million a mile per cable and we're talking about a lot of units being out there okay the other thing is well what's the what's the um the direction of the Gulf Stream because it always kind of looked like it was going north right and most of the time it does but about five percent of the time it doesn't reverse but it really changes direction so if you imagine tying a boat up and you've only got one wire on it and the, the water changes well, what's going to happen it's going to swing around and go back the other way and possibly mess up anything that it might be wrapped around so it's important also for us to see how how constant the um not only how constant the direction is but when it does change, how far it changes. So this is, it's not, these aren't in line this time. They're um, north, south, and then out to the east. We're trying to get a, a triangle pattern so we can kind of see if there's rotation going on as well. Because there's what's called eddies. They're these little, well, you saw them in the video. These whirlpools that propagate up. And so you can be sitting out there, and the next thing you know, you're, you're getting pulled to the south. It just happened well, with the Navy and stuff. Um, so this is, again, based on data that we actually recorded, and uh, it'll just give you an idea. So they're all kind of following each other, kind of, um, but then if you'll notice down, and the water flow is coming this way. So now this one starts to push that way a little bit, that one pushes, but it really gets interesting here on the 13th. It wasn't a Friday, it was just the 13th. So it comes over this way. And then it wobbles back that way, and then that one wobbles back, and then that one wobbles. And so you can see they're kind of, and if you, if you put what's called a tracer in here, and you just plot the ends of these through time, you get these swirls going up through the, in time, up the, up the coast. Say so there. So that's, that's quite a bit of change. If you go 90 degrees to the east, and you're, you're designed to be the current going that way all the time, you have to counter for that sort of thing. So, but again, with these new tools like the AECPs and putting these persistent moorings out there, we, we can, we're getting a lot more data than has ever been studied out in the Gulf Stream at this point. And we're starting to see a lot of this variability and seasonality, which is extremely important if you're trying to design to put something out there. Okay, so, um, and actually my intern, um, Logan, is going to be working on this and making it a little more user friendly. We're going to put some, not be so spartan like this right now. But, we come for his talk in, in uh, the end of the summer, and it, it should be cool. So the other the other thing that we do, so that's acoustically. We also use radar. So we have two stations on shore. We have one down at Hallover, down in uh, North Miami Beach. And we have one at Hillsboro, which is about 15 miles south of Boca Raton, our main campus. And so what these sites do is they send radar out. It reflects off the wave tops. And again, based on the Doppler shift of those radar this time, of the radio waves, not the sound waves, but the Doppler shift of the of the radar signals, again, you can get your speed and direction off of that. And so if you'll notice, it might not show very well, but we use this primarily to try to see, see the red and the blues and the greens and stuff. So the red is where the highest velocities are, okay? So we use this to try to gauge how far offshore the core of the Gulf Stream is and trying to correlate that with the historic measurements as well as the measurements that we're doing. Because at some point, if we can get this correlated with our point measurements, then we can say, all right, well, if it agrees with this point measurement here, we can interpolate between here and here and try to figure out what the flows are um, later on. Because if you have a device out here or a whole farm of devices, it's really good to know what's coming towards you so that you can adjust both your power loading and your settings and all that sort of stuff. So it's kind of like an early warning system with weather almost. So if we can see what's, what the current's doing and coming towards us out, at least even a couple hours, we can be ready for that and make sure that the the load levels that we're providing to the grid are, are constant. We're not getting brownouts and stuff like that, which is something I'm probably familiar with. And so all it really takes is on the beach, it takes two antennas, and they're about 150 feet apart. And um, fortunately for us, this is in a bathroom in Miami, so when I go down and work on it, it's an experience. But at least the park lets us use their building. So um, we've trenched in here, and so in the bathroom in the back room, among the mops and everything else, we have our computers, and that's where we bring in the data and everything. So that's something for you, you students to look forward to, um, working in bathrooms. 
but for science, right? Okay, so now that's how we get the general information on the currents and the resources and everything. Well, what happens in a significant event? Well, I'm probably the only person in South Florida that's been looking for a hurricane for the last 25 years or so because of the data. Nobody else wants to. Well, I don't really want to, but the data. So, so this is the closest we've got as far as from SNMREC when Sandy went by. Fortunately, very fortunately, it missed us. But even though it was out in the, uh, in the East Bahamas here, out in the, on the 26th of... Uh, 26th of October, we, we still got some significant effects right in here in our data. And uh, again, that's very important because what happens is when you get really strong winds blowing on an ocean surface, you get this, um, it's called Ekman forcing. And so there's, it starts to generate a current to the right angle to the direction of the wind. And so if the wind's blowing this way and the Gulf Stream's going that way, well, if the, uh, the Ekman forcing will go against the gets the current and it tends to slow the current down near the surface. The other way around, it's blowing the other way, it tends to speed the current up. So these are, again, these extreme events, and you get large waves, which we have to deal with. And um, anyway, so it was really interesting. And so what this, this shows, it's not current data, it's weather data from, from Fort Lauderdale. But it shows that as the pressure is dropping, right, this is the lowest pressure it got in Fort Lauderdale, starts to raise, the winds are originally coming out of, um, out of the out of the northeast, and right when the the eye, even though it wasn't the eye, but the lowest pressure at us, the wind switched almost immediately and started coming out of the uh, out of the northwest. So it, it shifted around, and in our current data, which unfortunately I didn't I didn't make up a, a graphic of that, that it just it was wrecking havoc on the Gulf Stream, and it was it was it was something that we're still looking into and trying to figure out how to address something like that because obviously here in Florida. We do need to address hurricanes from time to time. But what's interesting is that our CODAR system, when it was measuring, it was measuring through the storm, at least most of the way through the storm. Um, and so these are all current vectors. And so you can see how they're all, the, wind, the, the current's kind of getting pushed into shore, right? Pushed into um, up near Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale is right in here, and then Boca Raton up in. And this is an area of significant erosion. A1A actually was eroded down in Fort Lauderdale. I don't know if y'all remember that from the, the news and stuff. But they had to close A1A because the beach had completely eroded. And they were trying to figure out what happened. Well, it turns out that as, um, as the storm was going, see this persistent eddy right here? So the water, the currents just started churning right close to shore. And it just acted like a dredge. It just completely dug into the coastline. But we showed this to the county, and they, did, they, they had all these theories, but we showed them our radar data. And uh, they said, well, why did it only go up to midnight on the 26th? So, well, the reason is because the beach went away at midnight on the 26th. <laughs> so we went up there, and here we go. So that's not her, but that's all we've got was just the end of the cables. The rest, the ocean took away, along with the beach and everything else. So. Fortunately, the state has now stepped in the ocean, the energy office of the state, and they're providing us funding to replace these um, systems. They're going to be ruggedized, and they're not going to be on the beach. They're going to be on the other side of a seawall. But anyway, so that was just really interesting that we got that data, and now the counties are, are interested in it, at least a little bit, in using it for some shore protection monitoring and that sort of thing. So again, our research can, can kind of extend to other groups as well. So all that comes to now, what's our test facility going to be, okay? So if you compare this with that first cartoon that I showed you with hundreds and hundreds of turbines, this is much more modest, but it's achievable at least with the resources we have at the moment, and it'll reach the goals that we're after to enable developers to come and test in the actual environment. Because as you can see, you could tow devices all day long at a constant speed, see how they're doing, but as dynamic as the Gulf Stream is, you really need to test it in that real environment to make sure that it can handle all those different variables. And especially the larger these devices get, I mean, ours is a three meter rotor, the one out here, about 10 feet. Some of them are 30 meters, 100 foot diameter rotors out there turning. So over that distance, the currents at the top can be significant to the bottom. And it's like running a propeller halfway out of water, right? It'll just destroy the, the rotor. So we're working on ways to deal with that as well. So this is our proposed configuration. So we have a buoy that's moored to the seafloor out in about 1,000 feet of water. And then we come up with a ship. We have a little van here. It's called our lab van. We have our monitoring equipment. 
and then we lower devices down into the flow at various depths and we have our ABCPs transmitting through the entire water column. We have higher resolution. These measure about every three feet on the buoy measuring what's coming towards us and then on the, on the uh, turbine itself which you may have seen outside we have really high frequency ADCPs that can measure down to about, about two or three inches of resolution and so we use that like if you see a boat going through the water it kind of pushes the water out right it has a bow wave well on these devices that affects the flow going into the rotor and it affects your efficiency and all that sort of stuff so this allows us to look out past that bow wave and measure the water coming in and then help us to kind of adjust the shape of the device so that we minimize these disturbances and increase the efficiency of the devices. So this is the configuration that we're going to be talking about. So it requires a few things. It requires a buoy. And this is modeled after a, a Nomad buoy. Some of you guys may know what, what these are. It's an oceanographic buoy that has a bunch of sensors and stuff on it. But it's only designed to moor itself, not a, not a 100, 200 foot ship. And so we took the general design and we made what we call our MTB, our mooring and telemetry buoy. So it's about 22 feet long, 10 feet wide, 9 feet tall, but only sinks in the water about 4 feet. It weighs 9 tons or 18,000 pounds with all its battery and its load. But because of the hurricanes, it has 18 tons or a little over 35,000 pounds of reserve buoyancy, which means that it'll take 35,000 pounds to pull it underwater and hold it. So it's designed when these 40-foot waves come over it, that it'll pop back up through the waves, theoretically. But that's what it's designed to do. So, um, again, so so those sort of design considerations. So it's not just having the, the buoy there for doing the testing. It's a persistent presence out there, so we can measure all these different kind of conditions. And in the case of a surface buoy, we can send the data back in real time and actually see what's going on. Um, so. This was the first version. It was much smaller. It did all the performance, but it didn't have any reserve points. See, it actually went underwater a few times during testing, and so we kind of pimped our ride, right? We came and cut it in half, cut it lengthwise, and made it much larger with a lot more buoyancy. Um, and we just had this out back in 2013, the end of 13, like 12 foot seas, and it was, it was doing better than the boat that we were towing it with. So that was pretty good. So here's our rotor, so you've, I mean our turbine. So you've seen this offshore. And the cool part about this slide, at least for me, is that what we designed, the model, looks exactly like what we actually built and tested and worked. So that kind of indicates the whole 3D modeling and, and design, because uh, almost every aspect of it, if we need to change anything or if anything happens, we can just go back to the model and try different things. So that's, that's another part of this 3D modeling that we're doing in engineering these days. Instead of on paper where you need to draw it out and then get out the eraser if you change things. Well, in this, we can actually do it in 3D, modif modify things, move things around, check its weights, balances, all sorts of things. So it's, it's, it's a much better tool and it makes us, it helps us to do things quicker and more efficiently from a de design perspective. So um, if you notice, it's a single rotor, right? So uh, if you have a large enough rotor, the torque of that rotor, if it's in the water, it's just going to spin itself back up its mooring cable, right? So um, that's why several of these devices have counter-rotating propellers on them, so that as this one wants to twist that way, this one twists the other and it balances itself. Well, since ours is a single rotor design, and again, this is some of the engineering, so it might be a little mathy, but that was in the title, so you know what you're getting into. Um, so, so this is the rotor here, and it imparts a torque, this T, on the whole system as it's turning, and so we size these weights, which they look, well, they are stands for the turbine, but they're also full of concrete and, and steel for weight, and it actually acts as a counterweight to keep the whole thing from spinning, so it balances, and these are just different plots that we come up with at certain speeds, five knots, four knots, three knots, at both the locked rotor and then as the rotor's turning, so that we have to do all that because, again, we're sitting, standing back there deploying this thing, and we don't want it to, to be unstable. So we have to go through and do all these calculations in the engineering to make sure that it is stable once we deploy it. Um, when, we, when we have the turbine going, we're using it, we're doing uh, electronic speed controls, right? So we have all these electronics to make sure that not only it doesn't go too fast, but we can stop it and lock it. Well, if we lose power to the system, it's like a runaway locomotive, right? It can just keep going faster and faster and faster. 
So this is our dead man switch, if you will, or dead person, sorry. Dead person switch, where if we lose all other control, that this brake locks, it's just like the, lo the brake on your car, it locks the rotor and just keeps it from spinning so that we can safely bring it back on the boat. Um, and so this is our deployment, if this will work. I'm gonna segue to YouTube for just a second. Okay, so this is, uh, there should be some sound. It's rather invigorating sound, but. So this is as we're going offshore, that's Fort Pierce back there. We're heading offshore. Um, we had to go out about, what, 20 miles to get to the water depth we needed. And so um, that's the device on the back of the boat. I almost want to salute this music. So this is from the underwear camera, so you can see that the rotor's turning. Um, this is facing forward, and you can see the bottom of the boat on the upward camera, because we were wanting to watch the mooring attachment to make sure it wasn't doing anything crazy. We put tape on, on there just so we could see the revolutions to kind of balance that. And this is where we were bringing it up out of the water. Um, so even just the smallest amount, you'll see when it hits, the, it hits a little bit of thrust and see how fast it starts turning. Um, so, it, and the reason there's music is because we weren't allowed to use the audio that, that was actually recorded because we were fairly excited and this is a general purpose audience. So that's why we put the music instead. Um, but anyway, it was, after all those years of working on it, to see it turn, it was, it was emotional, if you will. So anyway, so this, we're pulling it back up. And again, one of the reasons for building a prototype is so we can learn how to put it over and back instead of, you know, like now, when we put it in the water, we have different ways so it doesn't swing as much and that sort of stuff. But it's just more of a practice device to, we get our, our groove down before we bring in a customer and then we can safely handle it and everything. So, um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty interesting day that we actually finally got it to work, so. So, so that's the, the turbine device, the ocean current turbine, which you see outside, and some of the things that we did to design that. So now, back to our overall system design. The other part, the, the very important part, is the mooring and holding the buoy up. And the mooring, if you can imagine it, if you've ever tied up a boat in a, a tidal flow or something, you know, you have to tie it pretty well. Well, imagine 1,000 feet of water, and you've got over five knots all the time out there, and you have to restrain that. And then also you throw in the waves and the currents and the mooring loads and all that sort of stuff. And so it really puts a lot of demand on your anchor and everything that's on the seafloor. So this is <laughs> a cartoon for sure. But this is just to, more informative to show that it's not just a rope going to the seafloor. It's a combination of different devices for specific reasons. So we have wire rope coming down from the buoy. And then we have a section of floats here. Because one of the things is, if you have over a kilometer or a half a mile of wire out there, and then you remove the buoy, all that wire falls on the seafloor. And if there's coral or anything else down there, you just dump it on the bottom. And it can cause significant damage, right? So I'll show you in a minute why we put these floats on there. It also adds what's called compliance. It's like a shock absorber on a car. So as those floats change, it reduces some of the shock load on the wire. Because if, if you shock a wire too often, it could part and break and stuff. And we have several layers of chain down here and then a, an anchor that needs to take the, the full load. And the chain, again, is a type of shock absorber so that as the current increases, it'll lift the chain off the, off the seafloor and it kind of keeps tension constant in the entire system. Well, when the current reduces, the chain falls back. And so you, it's kind of a way to maintain the, the tension on the entire mooring. Because again, you don't want a bunch of variations in your loads or you could break the whole thing. So um, after we did the tow tests of the MTV and everything, we compared that with the models that we made in the computer. And so these are the two matching curves. And it shows that we did a pretty good job. You know, R squared, or, or it's a metric of how well the data agrees is up in you know, 0.96, almost a 1, because 1 is perfect agreement right, between data. And so we're up in the high 9s um, as far as what we actually measured and what our computer simulations, which I'll show you, how they agreed. So that gave us some confidence saying, OK, now we can play with it in the computer, try different scenarios, and it should be close to what would happen in real life. right? So that's a, that's a very important part of computer modeling is to validate your, more, your models. 
I'm sure some of you guys know that, and, and I personally know from experience with the Navy that I got it wrong one time and it was not cool. But, um, but I learned a lot. Okay, so first thing is we put our mooring in. So this is our wire. These are our floats and our chain. And, but I didn't put an anchor in because I wanted to see how much force it would take for the whole system to just start dragging along the bottom. And then once I did that and I put the anchor in, that would tell me how much the size of the anchor and the mooring loads and all that sort of stuff. And so we put it in. And uh, so as you can see, the, the current is pushing on this entire system because cable drag on a mooring is quite a bit, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's pushing and pushing and pushing. As you can see, the chain is just dragging along the bottom. So I kept adding chain in the model until it stopped dragging, and that gave me a, a value for how much, what size the anchor needed to be and all that sort of stuff, okay? Which, if I did that in real life, it would be a real pain. So that was um, to determine. So then, based on the bottom type, well, what type of anchor do we use? So these are a small percentage of the number of anchors that are out there for different type of bottom. So these up here are mostly for like rock, and I hate to say it, but coral. Um, if, you, if you need, from a military perspective, if you need to more in a coral area, these are the best ones to use. I, this is the wrong audience for that. Um, if, you need to, if you need to more in, in mud or some other soft sediments, these down here are a little bit better because what's called their flukes or the, the, the flat parts are much larger and they give a suction load so you won't pull out. For our particular application, it's these anchors here. They're called drag embedment anchors, or D, well, DEA is even a bad thing to say, but drag embedment anchors. So the harder you pull on them, the deeper they go in the bottom, and the harder that they hold, OK? And this is the type that uh, we're considering using. It's called a Stato anchor. It was designed by the Navy, and we have thousands of test pulls of this particular device. So that's the one that we're using, um, because as you well know, if you, if you look at the specs from somebody that's selling something, it may or may not be exactly accurate. So you get something from the Navy, at least you have a little, well, that, I may be biased, but it might be a little bit more reliable. Um, so then you come up and say, okay, well, the farther I drag this thing, how much the, the stronger it gets. So this is drag distance in feet, and this is important from our environmental perspective, because the shorter that we need to drag this thing, the less bottom that we will affect, and we have to go survey and make sure that there's no organisms down there. So um, we do, these are just plots of the further you drag it, and this is the, the holding power, or how much it can resist. As you can see, the further you drag it out to a certain point, the more holding power you get. So we use these, these plots to try to figure out, okay, based on our drag and the modeling, how, much, how far we're going to have to drag it. And then for our permit requirement, we said, okay, we're going to need a box this big on the seafloor for our anchors, and that's what we had to go survey. Um, okay, so now this is going to show, um, so this is the mooring again, except now we have the vessel on here, the ship and the turbine, and it's pulling on the buoy. So you'll see it's going to be a much stronger, straighter line, because there's a lot more force on it, and you'll see there's going to be a lot of chain coming up off the seafloor. Um, and then after we're going to release the boat, and you'll see the whole thing spring back. And then I'm going to release the floats, and you're going to see how we'll recover a kilometer worth of wire so that we don't leave all that wire on the seafloor. Okay, so now this is just the model. The, the current's tightening everything up. And so as you can see, it's much straighter now. There's more chains coming off the seafloor. Because again, the, the tighter it is, the more it wants to bring the chain up. And then, it's been having coffee or something with me. Okay, so now the boat is gone, and see how the, the drag has gone, the load's gone down a lot. So now the chain's falling back down, and now it's taken a, a more like what we saw before. So now I'm, I'm letting go of the chain. And then these floats are going to float that side of the wire up. So now we have a U of wire. But now it's floating with the current, right? So there's no drag on it anymore. So now it's just freely floating along. And we can, we can casually, even though we're on the clock, we can casually come up and reel the cable back in. And we're not having to pull against thousands of pounds, like pulling an anchor out of the bottom. 
And, and also, all that wire is now not on the seafloor and affecting habitat and all that, that stuff. And then lastly, there's one section in there of nylon, the paint part. This paint part here, that's like four inch diameter nylon line, which is really springy. It's like a bungee cord. And this is just a plot of, the blue is just wire. So as this thing's going, it's just beating. It's just really stressing out the wire. You put that, the nylon in and you get these really reduced loads from the, uh, from the mooring. And so that really helps the longevity. Because we're hoping to have this thing out between two and five years at a time. And so that's a lot of waves going by, and that's a lot of shock load that we have to, to address. So, um, And then finally, this is how we're going to put the buoy out. Um, it's called an anchor last deployment. We just drag the buoy behind and then drop the anchor. And so obviously I need some more of that. I mean, I needed to model that, not as much for to know what would happen, because the regulators, I had to sh actually show them an animation and say, this is how we're going to drop the anchor, and we're not just going to drop it all over the place. So. So this mooring here, so that's the, the chain falling down, and then it breaks away at the ship and then pulls the whole mooring down. See how it kind of makes a pile on the bottom? So we're kind of like, we're, we're kind of precision dropping it right in an area. And then as the current takes the buoy, then it starts to pull the wire out of the pile so that we start with a really small area of effect and then only the amount of wire chain that needs to be comes out. So we're not just you know, dragging wires all over the seafloor and everything. Okay, and so this is an example. This is a buoy when I was with the Navy. We used to maintain this buoy over in the Bahamas in 6,000 feet of water, 2,000 meters. It's 50 foot diameter. And, uh, and so we had to maintain that. And so here's a video of one of the most lonely places I've ever been, <laughs> sitting there holding on to an anchor. And so... <laughs> He has everybody else is back filming, and I'm down there dancing with the devil. So what I have to do is pull a safety pin out. Well, first I had to take the straps off of that. They didn't film that part, but I have to pull a safety pin out, and then I trigger the release, and then away she goes. It's 80,000 pounds of chain, and that's the whole. That's a much larger buoy, but this at least gives you an idea of an anchor last deployment. <laughs> Exactly in that position all the time. So that's why we had to use so much weight to hold it down. Oh, I thought that was my video. I was like, I didn't put that sound in there. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, anyway, so that's a, an example, although it's much larger than we need to do, of an anchor last deployment. So, when we put our anchor 
chain down, that's pretty much how we're going to deploy it. We're going to drop the anchor first, it'll pull all the chain down, and then like the computer simulation showed, it'll pull out and then it'll be where it's going to be. So that's the engineering part. Now, just really quickly here, it comes back to well, where are we going to be? So this is Fort Lauderdale. This is our SeaTech campus down in Dania Beach. And these are the three blocks that we have permits for, um, for putting our devices out here. So now corals. And since we're not using the anchors for corals, we have to protect the corals. No, that's just a joke. Please take that off the table. Um, <laughs> so the, our sites down here, this is the habitat of particular concern for, for corals. And so we happen to be right in there. So we have to be very careful about where we put our anchors and wires and everything. So that requires doing on-site surveys. So um, the first thing we do, in, which they just did on the cruise Dennis mentioned earlier, they go out and do what's called multi-beam sonar. So if you think of, you know, we'll just say 50 little son uh, depth finders in a fan that go along and it measures the depth and then you can get really accurate maps of the seafloor. And so this is just an example of how a ship would do that. So the sonar is coming down in this fan, and it's, it's just giving you the depth of what's called a swath, a width of, of area. And so you can get really accurate um, measurements of what the seafloor looks like from a single ship going over and doing fairly wide, um, fairly wide passes. And so based on that, you can then take that data and make habitat maps. So um, this is just an example. These are the different habitats that they define. This is an escarpment. It's about, uh, what, 600 foot, six or 700 foot um, canyon wall, if you will, out there. And that's where a lot of the corals like to live because that's where the highest velocities are and you know, it brings them food and everything. So we're looking at putting our site up here on the inner platform. For a variety of reasons. Number one, out here is where all the benthic communities are, all the corals and everything that we need to protect. The other thing is from an engineering perspective, you don't really want to try to anchor on the side of the Grand Canyon or something similar to that. So we, we chose to be up here in a uh, much more benign and flat environment where we would go out and, and put our anchors and stuff. So it's kind of a win-win for both the engineering and the environmental side. Um, this is uh, our survey area, so the anchor would drop somewhere in this circle. And remember the variability in the flow that I showed you? Well, this is that plus or minus 20 degrees, typically. That So this is the area that we has a possibility of, of encountering with the chain. So we just make it into a box and we go out and survey that. And then this is an over, overview box with side scan survey where we just go and make sure that there's nothing just outside in case something happens. And so to go down and do that, you have to do visual surveys. Well, we either use surveys, uh, ROVs from other port institutions, or Harbor Branch has an ROV at the moment that we're still waiting to refurbish. But it has all the typical things. So it has an arm in case you did want to collect something. It has cameras, sonars, thrusters. It's just a typical ROV that can go out and do these type of surveys. And then this is what you would see sitting inside. You have the, the cameras, the control sonar. Um, just the same old stuff that you've probably seen in other talks. And then these are the type of images you get. We don't want this type of seafloor, but we do want that type. That's, the, that's what we really want right there. Um, is, and what this, this uh, ADCP anchor is sitting on. And that's two crabs, by the way, for, if, in case you're interested. I didn't realize that. But we actually took these pictures from the JSL, and Don and I were down there. And I'm like, wow, that's a big crab. And Don's like, it's two crabs. So we turned the lights off because we felt bad. <laughs> so um, anyway, so these are the different types of bottoms. This is a, a rocky you know, with rubble. We don't really want that because organisms tend to live in that. The, with the exception of railroad wheels, the, uh, there's not a lot of stuff out here, although there are some other species, and we have to address those as well. And this is just an, uh, a rendition of the ROV going and doing surveys. And then there's another way that you can do it without a cable device, and that's using what's called an autonomous underwater vehicle. It's like a robot sub that can, you don't have to control by the cable. It can go down and do its own surveys. So, ta-da! That's it. So that's um. So let me get the currents going. This is just another picture of the ocean currents, and you can see where they are. So that's my um, presentation on the the environment and the engineering regarding hopefully generating electricity for South Florida.